Okay, so let's finish up talking about uh, compensation. In the first part of the video, we had talked about, uh, we talked first about equity, what makes a payment fair. We talked about the definition of compensation, how it should be aligned uh, in terms of strategic HRM, talked about external and internal equity. We talked about 12 different characteristics of good compensation programs. Then we talked a little about job descriptions, and then we talked about the four factors in determining compensation, legal union, policy, and equity. And that pretty much covers the beginning. So where we are now is talking about the actual job evaluation process and how we set what's called pay rates. So the idea of this, this idea of a, a job evaluation or position evaluation, this is, it's something we've talked about before it is the measurement of the duties compared to some sort of predetermined yardstick, which just means a benchmark. That's another way to say that. Just the duties of the job compared to a benchmark. So first, of course, we need to set this benchmark. What do we consider to be good work? for this job. So if the job is salesperson, how much do you have to sell a month? If the job is marketing manager, what is good this month? Is it customer satisfaction? Is it employee satisfaction? Is it a certain amount of money? Is it a certain number of projects? It would, you know, what defines good work? So we have this benchmark and then we compare what you did, your duties, were they above the benchmark or below the benchmark or the same as the benchmark. This benchmark is also your KPI. So if you meet this, if you're good and you meet this level, well, then you get your bonus. But if you're below this level, well, you probably don't get the bonus. If you're above this level, maybe you move towards getting a promotion. But it's this idea of comparing the benchmark to the duties. And the reason we do this is so that we can determine relative worth. And I said in the first part, relative worth is really the key term in compensation that I want you to understand. What we did in the first video was mostly a prequel. It's mostly an introduction. Relative worth is the key idea. So the concept obviously is worth. How much are you worth as a salesperson? How much is a marketing manager worth? How much is the department head worth? How much is the warehouse package handler worth? Now, when we say worth, what we mean is worth to the organization. So we have this idea of an internal measure. And then we also have an external measure. So we know in other companies what the let's say the, the call center operator is worth. Per hour, we know what they pay. And that gives us some idea of our external equity and what we should pay too. But then also the question is, what is this person worth to our organization? And these ideas of worth are the foundation for our compensation and for our sal salary ranges. We can't really decide, comp uh, we could decide it just based on the same as what everybody else in the industry does or a little bit more, a little bit less. But if we want to have an effective compensation plan, sorry, I forgot the covering again, as I always do. But if we want to uh, have an effective compensation plan, we do want to know what each of our employees is worth to us. One of the ways we establish this idea of relative worth is by looking at something called the Hay Guide. The Hay Guide separates worth, what are you worth, into three categories. And these three categories talk about the skills and the duties required in jobs. Now, they're not specific duties. So a salesperson has certain specific requirements and a marketing manager has other duties on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not what we're talking about with the Hay Guide. We're talking about more general duties and skills, such as do you need a lot of technical knowledge? Does somebody who is a marketing manager need a lot of technical knowledge about marketing, about platforms, about print versus website versus television? Yeah, they do. 
you can't do the job if you have no idea how to contact a newspaper versus a website versus social media. If you don't know these things, you can't do, you can't be a marketing manager. There's technical knowledge required. Is there technical knowledge required for being a salesperson? Well, yes, but different. Uh, there's some things that are specific, like you need to know how to use the register or write a receipt. Also, you need to probably know some technical specifications. Think of someone who works at an Apple store. They need to know a little something. They don't need to know how to fix a computer, build a computer, code a computer, write, write software, but they need to know a little about the specifications. Is there practical know-how? Well, a salesperson might have to really practically communicate with a lot of different people where a marketing manager is probably only working with the marketing team. So while they both require practical knowledge, both positions, they require different amounts. Planning and organizing skills, I think it's safe to say that a manager needs a much higher level of planning and organizing skills. Communicating skills, maybe a salesperson needs this too. Influencing skills, maybe a salesperson needs this too. So what we do is we have all of these ideas and each of them gets a number. Let's say, and the number could be out of 100, it could be out of 10, it's really up to the business, but let's say we're doing it out of 100. So for practical knowledge, we say that a salesperson at our store or our company needs to have a practical knowledge of 50 out of 100. And a marketing manager needs a practical knowledge also, 50 out of 100. What about technical knowledge? Well, I'd say a marketing manager is probably higher. Let's say they need technical knowledge of 70 out of 100, where a salesperson needs 30 out of 100. So already you see, if you add these 50 plus 30 and 50 plus 70, the marketing manager's score is already higher. And that means they're going to get paid more because these scores, the sum of these scores, the total number is going to determine their compensation. So this is the know-how category. We also have a problem solving category, which talks about how much do you need to, what environment are you in and how much of a challenge uh, is thinking. Then the accountability category. Does a salesperson have a lot of freedom? No, of course not. They have to sell these things and they have to be in this room selling these things where a marketing manager has a lot more freedom. Magnitude, the size of what you're doing, so a marketing manager may be doing a web-based promotion that costs a million dollars. A salesperson is trying to sell iPhones at you know, $700 each. So different magnitude and the amount of impact it may have. A successful marketing campaign could bring in millions of dollars. A successful salesperson could bring in thousands of dollars. A very significant difference. And so for each of these, we give a number. And then where we use these numbers, we have our job descriptions, so we know everybody's duty. We know where it fits within our organization, that's the worth. And then we measure these three areas, the know-how, problem solving, and decision making. We add the numbers, so we assign points, then we add them, we rank the positions. And then finally, when, when all the jobs have numbers, the marketing manager has a number and the salesperson has a number and the department head has a number and the warehouse package handler has a number. Then we do want to validate the rankings to make sure they are correct. And we validate this by using benchmarks. So benchmarks are the standard, right? The standard of what is good performance. So if let's say the marketing manager has a score for their compensation of out of 500, they get a four, 400. So they have a score of 400. Well, what's a benchmark of what we consider to be good performance? Maybe in our opinion, I say we, our, what I mean is HR. This is HR class. So we are HR and we are building this compensation plan. So what to us, and of course we get this from doing the job description and the job specification, the job analysis, what according to us is a good marketing manager? 
Let's say we've decided by talking to people, doing surveys, interviews, questionnaires, observations, participant diaries, we've determined that 350 is good. That's what we want. And this month, you as marketing manager got 400. Great. But if we don't have that number, 350, of what is good, then saying you got 400, I mean, okay, is that good? Is that bad? Oh, this month you got 275. Okay, is that good? Is that bad? Should you get a promotion? Should you get a punishment? Should you get a bonus? And we need to have some sort of standard of what we consider to be good. And then that tells us where the compensation should be. So how do we establish this compensation? What we're going to call pay rates. Pay rates give us an idea of what number people get and how that will match payment. So first, we, there are five steps here that we'll go through. The first step is to do a salary survey. And this is very simple. This is just external equity, right? Doing a salary survey means finding out what do other, other companies in the same field pay similar positions. So if we're a company that sells winter clothes, what do other companies that sell winter clothes pay their marketing manager or their, their uh, salesperson? After external equity, we go to internal equity. And for internal equity, we're talking about relative worth, which we already started talking about, but we'll get into a little, a little deeper. Then once we have the external and internal, remember I've said this a bunch of times now that these are the two most important things. Once we have these two, external and internal, then we create our pay grade. Once we have that, we can use this to create a wage curve, which isn't really a curve, it's more like a straight line, but we'll create some kind of straight line that tells us based on, we'll have an X, Y axis, and then based on um, the level, like the number that someone got, here's let's say 100 and 200 and 300 and 400 and 500, you know, based on the number they got and the compensation ring, the grade that they're in. So here's grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, and each grade has more money. Now, if somebody over here got a 400, we know what grade they're in. And that's very important for us. So we'll talk about how to make that. And then finally, we'll have a rate range, which establishes that it's not an exact number, right? What's the range between here? Our range is 100 between 300 and 400. So we have a range of 100 points here. That should also correspond to a range of salaries. So again, we start with step one, the salary survey. And that's finding out what do other companies competitive companies in the industry pay their workers at the same position. We're looking to make a compensation package for our salespeople, for our marketing manager, for our department head, for our package handler. Let's look at other businesses that do the same thing or pretty much the same thing we do. Okay, we sell winter clothes, maybe they sell summer clothes, but you know, similar idea and figure out what they pay people. So this gives us the beginning of our benchmark. This, what we would say is it anchors, right? It anchors the pay scale so that the pay scale doesn't move. An anchor is something that stops a boat from moving. So we wanna have an idea of where we should start. And we get that with external equity. Now, once we have an idea of external equity, so we wanna make sure that the industry is similar to ours. We want to make sure that the organizations are similar to ours that we're looking at. We want to make sure that the positions are common, that we're not measuring salesperson against website designer. They're different jobs. We want to measure salesperson against salesperson. We want to check out not only how much are they paying their salespeople, but are their salespeople working a similar number of hours? If our salespeople work 40 hours a week, and we're comparing them to company X, are the employees there working 50 hours, 20 hours, 80 hours? We have to be able to compare it. Are they getting the same benefits? Are they getting health care? Are they getting paid in a similar way? All of these things should be similar. 
And then we'll use questionnaires or interviews to collect the data. And then that'll give us our basic anchor point of what a general salary should be. Now we could stop there, right? We could just ask ourselves, is this organization comparable? Um, have any of our employees left to work at that company? That's a good question that would show it's similar. Are the company's operations similar to ours? Do we have a lot of jobs in common? Is it competitive? Is this data accurate? So, okay, we get all this data. It's accurate. It's for a summer close company. We're a winter close company. And then we know what they're paying people pretty much. And we can get a lot of this data from things like online websites, Glassdoor, salary.com. Um, here's a US office or CNN money. There's lots of websites that can give us ideas, even ONET that we looked at at the beginning can give us ideas of salaries. So once we have this anchor point, we know what reasonable compensation is, now we have to figure out relative worth. And part of the reason we need to understand this, why we can't just use the numbers we got from another company. Well, let's say we have 10 salespeople and some salespeople are doing better than others and they've sold more and we give them a bonus. And salesperson number one comes into your office, we are HR, they come into our HR office, and they say, why is salesperson number two getting more money than me? Why is salesperson number three getting more money than me? You know, they wanna know. Now we could just say, oh, well, salesperson number two is better than you, but that's not a reasonable thing to say. We could say, well, look at the sales. Salesperson number two is selling more than you're selling. Okay, but then what that means to us in HR is that the only thing we care about is how many units you sell. And that's not great. That's not always true for one. What if um, employee number one isn't selling as much, but the customers love employee number one and they give wonderful reviews and they all bring new customers uh, they bring their friends and their friends say, oh, it's because employee number one was great. Employee number two, the customers don't really like him. But this month, he's been selling a lot because he just keeps going out and he, he says anything to sell. Is customer two, is employee number two better? Is that what we want? Do we want somebody who's going out and maybe lying to the customers or being emotionally manipulative? in order to sell, and it's not the only thing we care about. We're not trying to have a company that's open for two years and then closes. We're trying to have a company that's open for hundreds of years, right? Our job as HR is to make sure that a lot of different metrics are being met. It's not just about number of products sold. So maybe employee number one, who has excellent customer satisfaction ratings, actually should get a benefit. But to know that, we need to look at relative worth. So relative worth is the way we compare jobs to determine the worth of one job relative to another. That's the relative worth. How much is a package handler worth to us? How much is a marketing manager worth to us? Who's worth more, advertising manager or marketing manager? I mean, how do you decide something like that? We are in HR. Our, we're not marketing managers. We're not advertising managers. How are we supposed to know exactly the difference and who should get paid more? So we have to compare these jobs. We have to compare them in terms of what they do, things like how much effort they require, how much responsibility the job has, what skills the job requires. There's a lot of different things. Now we already, I can't go back backwards in this PPT, um, but there's a lot of things we just looked at in the Hay Guide, which was like know-how, practical experience, uh, practical knowledge, technical knowledge, things like the thinking environment, the thinking challenges, and then things like your magnitude, impact, responsibility. All of these things determine the worth of an employee in a number, in a numerical, quantitative way. Um, we have a little discussion or an activity that we'll do in class. And then we'll talk about compensable factors. 
So relative worth is made of compensable factors. This idea of what is an advertising manager worth to our company? Well, what are the factors, right? So we could just use the intuitive approach, which is more valuable to our company, advertising manager or marketing manager? And then you say, oh, I think it's advertising manager. Okay, cool, we'll pay her more. That's intuitive. That's just your opinion. But then if the marketing manager comes and says, hey, HR, why is the advertising person earning more than me? What are we supposed to say? Oh, we think they're more important than you. If, that, if we say that, we're going to lose our marketing manager. They might quit. So we want to be able to say, well, your jobs both have different factors. For example, you both need to communicate. That's a factor. You both have different levels of responsibility. That's a factor. You both have different skills required. That's a factor too. Maybe for marketing, they need to know all kinds of marketing theories and how to use uh, internet-based tools to construct a marketing campaign. Maybe for advertising, they don't. Then the skills would be different, right? So each job has different factors and each factor is a number could be out of 10, it could be out of 50, it could be out of 100, but it's going to be a number. So let's say it's out of 10. And we say that for the factor of skills, for the factor of skills, advertising manager is seven out of 10. And marketing manager is eight out of 10. Okay, well, we're gonna add up that and we'll also add up the number from effort and we'll add up the number from responsibility and working conditions and all the different things we just saw on the hay guide. We'll add up all these numbers and see who has a higher number because that person is going to get paid more. Now we can do this a bunch of ways. We can just have one compensable factor like simple job difficulty. But of course, this is the same as using intuition. We can put a number on this. We could say out of 10, advertising manager is eight and marketing manager is also eight. But I mean, that's not very clear. And if we say out of 100, what are we just guessing? Advertising manager is 83 and marketing manager is 84. Why? You know, we're just guessing. So instead, what we really want to do is we want to use classifications. We want to use multiple compensable factors. So we have jobs that are put into categories by the score that they get um, using what's called the point method, the quantitative point method. So the point method is exactly what I was just saying. You have several compensable factors, skill, effort, responsibility, working conditions, thinking, challenges, practical knowledge, technical knowledge, magnitude, impact, just whatever. I mean, there's no perfect list. Each company will, will have their HR department decide what compensable factors are suitable for these jobs, for these comparisons. So you choose your compensable factors and then you give points based on interviews, questionnaires, surveys, observations, participant diaries, all the same things we always use to find out what, how much responsibility is required. We ask managers on a scale of one to 100 for this job, you know, what do you think the number of effort is? You know, we'll, we'll do our best to get these numbers. It's not mathematics. It's not hard science. It's not an exact number. It is kind of subjective, but we do our best using interviews and surveys and all these methods to give numbers to the compensable factors add it all up, and then we get a total number of points for each job, much points for each job. So it's this kind of method. We use our job analysis and job descriptions to figure out all the duties and responsibilities and tasks. Then we put jobs that we think are in groups together. We choose which compensable factors we're gonna use in this company for these jobs. We then rank the jobs, we give points, and then we combine all these points and get a total score. Right now, one way to do this in a smaller company would be to use alternation ranking. And we've already learned about this when we talked about um, 
evaluations and assessments. And this was the idea of putting people in an order. So let's say our company has 10 salespeople. In that case, we really could take, you know, two cards. Each card is one person, right? Take two cards and say, who's better, who's worse? Okay, this person's better. And then this person's worse. And then take two more names. Okay, who's better, who's worse than these people? We say this person is a little better and this person is in the middle. And then we just take cards and back and forth, we just put them in a rank. With a small group, you can do that. With a big group, you, you can't really put a hundred people into a rank. So it's highly preferable to use these numbers, these compensable factors to find relative worth. So let's say we have all these numbers now. We have our benchmarks for difficulty. We think that an advertising manager should be at 70 out of 100. For skill, we think an advertising manager should be at 80 out of 100. For um, problem solving, we think an advertising manager should be at 85 out of 100. We have all these numbers that we've decided this is what is good performance. Now, we are going to separate jobs into pay grades because a grade like grade A, grade B, grade C, grade D, let's say we're talking about grade A, give me the highest paid people. Well, there's a lot of different jobs at many companies that all have very highly paid people. So the manager or the director of HR for Apple computers makes a lot of money. So does the director of advertising. So does a CEO. So does a vice president. They, these jobs are in totally different departments, but they all might make a similar amount of money because they all might have a similar amount of points. So we want to put them together, group these jobs into grades. So let's say one grade, grade A, is 85 to 100. Let's say 80 to 100. 8200, any job that scores with when we add up all the factors that scores 8200 is going to be in A. And B is 60 to 80 and C is 40 to 60. So we use the point method and then jobs that fall within a range of points are put together. If it's a total of a thousand points, then we might have 800 to a thousand. You know, anything that falls in that range is pay grade A. Now, of course, pay grade A is not just one salary. Maybe that pay grade A is 80,000 a year at the bottom and 300,000 a year at the top. It could be a really, really wide range of salaries. It depends on the company. But that's the thing we're going to do next. That's step three is decide based on the similarity of the numbers, the compensable factors what kind of jobs get grouped together into what kind of categories. Then we use a wage curve. So as I said, a wage curve is really a straight line, but what it does is it shows the average pay rates for each pay grade relative to the rankings. So you have the grade, right? A, B, C, D, you have these grades on the Y axis. And on the X axis, you have like, kind of like this. On the Y axis, you have the grades, on the x-axis, you have the uh, quantitative ranking. Did you get 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 when we add up all your points for your relative worth? So again, the wage curve shows a relationship between on one side, the value of the job, which is you know the relative worth out of a thousand points, how many points? are you worth? That's your value. If a job has 950 points out of a thousand, this job is worth a lot to our organization. If a job has 200 points, it's not worth very much and we could find somebody else to replace the employee easily. So we'll compare the value of the job, the relative worth, to the pay rate for the job. And it looks something like this. This is just an example. This is for a very low paid job. Right, so this is even you know not real anymore because this is below minimum wage where you have ten dollars at the top and four dollars at the bottom and nobody's getting paid that. But then here you have the 
points. So their point system is out of 300. 300 is the most. And if you get 300, you get the most money here, which is $10 an hour. Now, what if you get only 250 points? So their range is 50 points. If you get 250, how much money do you get? Let's say we go up here. Here's 250. And that equals around, let's say, 850 an hour. So 850 versus uh, this, well, this would be a little higher, but let's say 300 is around $9 an hour. Now, both of these people, person A who got 300 and person B who got 250, both of them are in the same range, right? They're both in like, if this is number one and this is you know, two and three and four, and five. Both of these people, person A and B, are in range number one. But range number one goes from $8.50 to $9.50. And so if you get more than that, then you move into the next, the next range. So the way we find this out is we look at a lot of different jobs. These, each point here is a job. And we could look at other industries. We could look at our uh, company. And we look at all these different points. So here it's out of 500. And you see they have right now 11 categories. Each category is 50 points, right? So we look at all these categories and then we look at our employees. And we say, well, this person happens to make $8 an hour. And their score is you know, 350 about. This person also uh, makes about $7 an hour, but their score is much higher. Their score is, you know, for uh, 450. So that's not really fair. And this person, you know, just we look at all these different people in our company. This person over here only makes about, you know, 250 an hour, 350 an hour, a little less, 325 an hour, but their score is pretty high. Their score is like 150 compared to this person who earns more, but their score is really low. So right now, we're not looking at the way things should be. We're looking at the way things are. So if you go into a company and you start working in their HR department, like in China, before you would decide what the compensation should be, look at what the compensation is. First, of course, you need these point values. You need to know what are your compensable factors, what is your relative worth, you have to do the job analysis, and then you can make these point values for every job. Then put that on the side and make this chart where you look at how much are people actually getting paid for their point value. And then you draw a line that touches as many points as possible or is as close to as many points as possible. And this should give you a range. Now, what this would tell you is this particular job is being paid incorrectly. And this particular person is also being paid incorrectly. And those two should be changed. But most of these people are being paid correctly. And that's very important to know so that everybody's paid in a, a meaningful way. Once we've done this, then the last thing to do is for kind of a bigger company, we would create what's called a rate range. So most employers don't just, as I said, pay one amount. Each range has like $8 to $10. And as long as you're in range one, you could go anywhere um, within there. But in a really big company, this is an example of the American government, the federal government for the area of Washington, Baltimore, Northern Virginia. So for this area, you see they have lots of grades. They have 15 different grades. So if you start at grade one, here's how much you're gonna make per year. $22,115 per year. If you end at grade 15, I can't see it here, but you know it's obviously over $150,000. And each grade has 10 steps. Now, the reason for this is rather than moving people up different grades, it's better to have one grade and you move up in steps. And when you get to the 10th step, then you move to grade two, zero. Then 10 steps. Then when you get to number 10, you move to grade three, zero. So it's almost like, um, well, it doesn't matter. I was gonna say using an abacus, 
but I don't think you guys know what that is necessarily. But either way, it's a, a reasonable way to have, instead of just 15 grades, now you have 15 times 10, so you'd have 150 different variations. And that's very useful, if I'm getting that math right. So one other thing to notice about something like this, this salary table, is let's look at grade three, for example. Now you start at 27,130 per year. And if you get all the way up to grade 10, you're earning 35,269. That is the most money that you can earn in grade three. However, look at grade four. Grade four, 30,456, that's less, a lot less than grade three, step 10. In fact, Grade four, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five are all less than grade three, step 10. So what would be the benefit of moving up to grade four? You know, grade four, step one, two, three, four is gonna be less than the previous grade. Well, the benefit is when you get past step five, you get to much bigger numbers. And then you go to step, uh, you go to grade five. And again, your salary may drop down, but usually it doesn't. What would happen is if you were at grade four, step 10, your next salary promotion, your raise would be to grade five, step six. So that you move up maybe only $200, but you're actually at a whole new grade now. And one of the important things about these kind of salary tables is if you, let's say you work at this job for 10 years and at the end you're at grade 10, step three, for example. If you quit this job and you look for a new job, you're gonna be able to tell them, here's the government salary table, I was at grade 10. I expect to start the new job at grade 10. It's just like if you leave a job as a manager, your next job, you're looking for a manager job. It's the same with salary tables. You're gonna stay with the grade you've earned. And that's very valuable. Okay, that's all we're gonna say about these methods. Now, what about managerial or professional jobs? You know, it's a little different when you're talking about giving a number like this to a CEO or a senior vice president. And the reason is, these jobs, like a, a senior senior management job, it usually has very non-quantifiable factors. So if we're talking about judging a senior vice president, we're not talking about the number of units they sold or packages they moved or their customer satisfaction. Senior vice presidents don't really have customers like that. They're in charge of the business. They don't necessarily they work with stakeholders or shareholders, but they don't really work with customers. They work with things like judgment and problem solving. You know, so when we look at a higher level managerial job, you're, some of the factors, the compensable factors we're looking at, instead of looking at duties and skill, we're looking at things like span of control, which is how many employees does each manager watch? or manage. Does a manager manage five employees or 50 employees? That does reflect a difference in their level of responsibility. Their management level, are they a junior vice president or a senior vice president? Also the employer's ability to pay. Are they bringing in a big profit? The executive's human capital, what's the education or the experience of this senior vice president. Also for executives like a senior vice president or a head of department, another big difference is they don't just get a salary. Now no employees really just get a salary only part-time workers or independent contractors would get no benefits. Employees do get benefits. They'll get health care, they'll get insurance, their taxes are paid, maybe they get vacations or holiday time, maybe they 
have some sort of child care program or educational benefits. There's all kinds of benefits that employees do get. Top executives, their benefits are sometimes very different. So they do get a salary, just like anybody else, and this is fixed. This is their money per month. It's guaranteed. Sometimes they also have guaranteed bonuses, like a Christmas bonus that's guaranteed. And then they also have discretionary bonuses, bonuses that they might get if they meet a certain level of efficiency, productivity, effectiveness, profitability, something like that. They might also have short-term incentives, and that could be stock or it could be cash, this is like a bonus that they would get for achieving a short-term goal. Then there could be long-term incentives. Long-term incentives would be something like stock options. So stock options are not stock. Um, a lot of people make this mistake, the, the word stock is there, but it doesn't mean you get stock. What it means is if you're an executive, you get the right to buy stock at a specific price for a specific period of time. So let's say that you get a job working at IBM and you're going to be the director of HR and they offer you stock options at $20 for three years. That means you can buy their stock. Let's say you have stock options of 10,000 shares at $20 for three years, which means within three years, you can choose any time you want to buy up to 10,000 shares for $20 each. Now, let's say right now the price is 16. Well, let's say, yeah, sure, let's say it's 16. You're not gonna wanna buy it now because you're buying it for 20. That would be stupid. It's worth 16, don't buy it for 20. But if you're a good executive, you expect maybe the price is gonna go up. And when the price goes up to $50 per share, you can buy 10,000 shares at 20 and then immediately sell them at 50. That's a lot of money right there. So you get this possible bonus. Usually it has to vest, which means you don't get it today. You might get, if you can buy 10,000 shares, you get half of that in a year and the other half after two years. You have to work for a period of time for these options to vest or else people would just take the job, get the options and then, you know, pretty quickly make some money and quit the job. So it does take time for them to vest. Also, there are other executive benefits, things like retirement plans, cars, supplemental or additional insurance, uh, golden parachutes, you know, where you get money if you quit, no matter what, no matter what the reason, even if you're fired, you get this huge amount of money. So top executives, we're not just talking about salary. We're talking about a lot of other things. Okay, next thing to talk about is compensation programs. So we talked a little at the beginning about all of these 12 different things needed to make a compensation program fair or effective. You need internal ex equity, external equity. It needs to be accepted by senior management. It needs to be not too complicated or time consuming. It needs to work with motivation and help the employees to succeed and retain talent and all of these different things that are important. One of the things that was important, very important, is it has to align what you want from the employees with what you want from the business align the employees with the business goals. And we had talked last time about the idea that if our school, CIP, wants to be an entrepreneurial school, maybe they should, in addition to the teacher's base salary, give some sort of bonus or incentive for teachers who do entrepreneurial things with the students. And every time a teacher helps a student open a business, then the teacher gets a bonus of, you know, whatever, a thousand RMB, whatever it is. And that is something that is aligned, right? CIP wants to have an entrepreneurial school, make a compensation program that encourages this kind of behavior. And also these programs should be flexible. The company's gonna grow or shrink, anything could happen. Now we understand that we must start with base pay that there has to be pretty much for every job, some level of payment 
there are some jobs that are 100% commission. Most jobs are not. Even something like a waiter or a real estate agent where they have a relatively low base pay and then they get commissions on top of that, they still do get base pay. Now, how is the base pay decided? It could be based on seniority, how long someone has been with the company. That's what most businesses did in the past. If you work for the company and you were loyal for 20 years, you make this much money. And it doesn't really matter if you're the best. You know, it matters that you have been there and that you're loyal. A more modern idea is to pay a little bit more based on merit so that an above average employee would make more money. I think you can understand why someone who's been at the company for 20 years would be very upset if a new employee has been there for two years and they now make more money, right? The, you don't want people with 20 years to quit. They know your business, they know your model, they know the customers. If they've been there 20 years, obviously they're good enough. You don't want to lose that kind of loyalty, but you also don't, you also do want to encourage above average employees and say, listen, if you stay here and you work really hard, you will earn more money. So how do you balance these two things? The person who's been here a long time and wants financial compensation for that loyalty and the above average new employee who also wants to be compensated for their abilities. Well, one thing we can do is we can use non-monetary ways to reward the above average employee. And that could be public recognition, like an employee of the month. It could be a certificate. It could be gift certificates. There are things we can give the above average employee besides just a raise in their base pay. So the thing we're gonna look at for above average employees, we'll look at how often do they get a review? So for a higher level job, like a manager or a CEO or a vice president, it takes a lot of time to review these people. The more often that someone is reviewed, the less of an increase they'll get each time. If you're reviewed every three months, you're not gonna get a big raise four times a year. If you're, if you're reviewed once per year, well, then you might get that whole raise at the same time. So for an above average employee, we wanna see how often are they being reviewed? How many employees are receiving a salary increase? Are we only giving it to the above average people? Then maybe we give them more money. Are we giving it to 80% of the employees? And then how much money are we giving? Are we giving 1% of your salary or 12% of your salary. I don't know why I chose 12. You know, the length that you've worked at a job is relevant. There's no question. You know, performance generally follows a curve. So if you've worked at a job for more time, generally there is an increase in your ability to produce, in your value to the company. Most organizations using merit, they pay to 80 to 90% of employees. So this is not a reward for your best five people. This is a reward for almost everybody, usually. It doesn't have to be. The amount that you give someone as a merit reward depends on the market. It depends on your budget. It depends on what do other companies pay because you don't want to lose people. It depends on how, uh, how effective is your current compensation strategy at attracting talented people or keeping them. The long-term goals of the organization, the cost of living, you know, people are gonna get paid more in Los Angeles or London than they're going to get paid in a small town in the middle of the country because apartments are more expensive in London, you know, than they are in whatever, Ohio. Now, instead of this system because in this system merit-based people do get different salaries you have somebody who's been there a long time you have somebody who did really great in their recent project you have somebody who has wonderful customer satisfaction you all these people might get different salaries 
Instead, what some jobs prefer to do is they prefer to give just a single rate. Now, when people give a single rate, of course, you can't never give a raise. Raises and promotions need to happen. So usually a single rate is used with step rates. It's used, let's say, for example, in a factory type situation, a, I guess we would call it an autocratic leadership situation, as opposed to democratic or laissez-faire. So something like McDonald's or the Ford car company. Let's say that you work at the Ford car company and you get hired. All new hires in the Ford factory pay, for example, $10 an hour to start, everybody. Now, if you can get your license to drive a forklift, that's like the little machine that has long metal bars that come out and lift very heavy things and move them. And if you can get a license to drive that, you go from $10 to 12, that's one step. Now you earn $12 an hour. And if you can get a certificate showing you know how to use this machine over here, a lathe or something, now you go to $14 an hour and you earn 14. And you have these steps. When you reach a step, you've learned a new skill or ability, now your salary goes up and that's your new base salary. This helps people to learn a job. It's very effective when you have the kind of business like a factory where most of the people maybe don't have a very high level of higher education. They went to high school, some went to college, in this kind of environment, you want them to learn. And so the pay increases by steps in order to meet very specific standards. Did you learn this? Did you get, you know, 10 days without a complaint? Okay, your salary goes up. So as I said, these are often used in factories or any sort of manufacturing setting where there are very clear steps or very clear standards for efficient performance. Can you use each machine? How many pieces do you produce per day? Things like that. So we use this where most of the jobs have similar difficulty. If you're looking at McDonald's, all of the people who work there, the jobs have a similar difficulty. Now, maybe you are working French fries or you're making hamburgers or you're cleaning. It's all similar levels of difficulty, except the manager. Uh, same for like the factory at the Ford car company. Employees work at approximately the same speed to reach their goals. So nobody comes in or almost nobody comes in and in one month learns every machine. Usually it takes almost everybody one month to learn this machine. And it takes everybody another month to learn this machine. And it's always about the same amount of time so that nobody's too far ahead of anybody else. Routines are very specific, very clear. Schedules make it so there is really no opportunity for individual effort to affect output. You know, it's gonna take you a month to learn this machine. It doesn't matter if you come in earlier. It doesn't matter if you stay later. It doesn't matter if you read books on it. It's gonna take you about a month, right? We do, you know, 100 of these lathe holes per day. That's it, that's what we do. We don't want you to do 300, we don't want you to do 10. We want you to do 100, it's very specific. Now the drawback of using a single rate pay is that it really doesn't take into account individual performance. You might come to work and really have a wonderful attitude and everybody loves to work with you. You're gonna earn the same amount of money as someone with a terrible attitude because it's not about that. It's about, can you use these machines? Are you learning? And if you are, then you get that amount of money. So there are some drawbacks. Um, instead of a single rate, we could use a variable pay. Now, merit, which we learned about, where people get paid different amounts, that's an example of variable pay. That's a kind of variable pay because that links your salary with some kind of measurable accomplishment. It could be your merit. We can measure how long you've worked at this company. You worked here for five years or 10 years or 20 years, we can measure that. We can measure your productivity or your customer satisfaction and you have different levels that people will get paid. 
Now, another element of variable pay is the idea of risking your money if certain goals are not met, risking money based on goals. This is very common among senior management, and it was not as common among employees, but now it's becoming more, more common. So the idea would be, let's say that I tell you you're a salesperson in our company. We sell winter clothes, and I say your KPI this month is to sell 20 winter jackets, winter coats, sell 20 winter coats and have a customer satisfaction of above 80. Now, if you do that, I will give you a bonus of 5,000 RMB this month. But if you don't do that, you'll lose 500. Do you want this risk? Or do you just wanna keep your base salary? You already have a base salary, nothing's gonna change with that, but I'll allow you to risk 5%. And if you achieve your KPI, then you get this big bonus. And if you don't, then you lose a little. So managers and vice presidents and executives, they actually risk a lot. They may risk up to 35% or more of their compensation on a KPI. Because if you're an executive, a senior vice president, we don't need you to do the same thing every day. We need you to push our company upwards. And if you do it, the rewards are huge, millions of dollars. But if you don't, don't expect a big salary. We're not giving you a salary to just keep the status quo. We're giving you a salary to push the company up. You succeed, you get a big pay payout. You fail, you don't. Typical employees don't risk anything like that, maybe just 5%. There are disadvantages to this, and one of the disadvantages is about teams. So these days, we want to work in teams. Teams are very important. However, if you're working in a team and then the team succeeds, how do I compensate people for variable pay? What if you didn't meet your KPI, but your team, which is the store, met their goals? So the team gets a reward, but you don't. It just, it makes it a little difficult because this variable pay idea is really every person having their own KPI or their own you know, key performance indicator or goal. Now there are team-based awards, which we're actually gonna talk about uh, in the next PPT, which is about incentives, but there are team-based awards. Um, Skill-based pay. Okay, so this is very similar to the single pay rate. This is based simply on skills. Every time you get a new set of skills, you, you know, step up. The problem with this is you can max out, right? Once you've learned, let's say you come into the Ford factory, you start at $10 an hour, then you learn this skill, you go to 12. You learn this new skill, you go to 14. You learn how to drive a truck, you go to 20. You know, but at some point, that's it. There's no more skills to learn. And that can be a problem with this kind of payment. Um, again, this is usually found in manufacturing, right? Competency-based pay. So this is about what you can do, not about the job you hold. This is actually very common. So for example, let's say that you work at our company in the marketing department and you get a master's from a university in marketing. Your salary might go up. Do you do more for our company? No. Do you have more responsibility, more duties, more magnitude? More? No. But it's not about what you do for us. It's about what you can do. So this is where getting more education or learning more can actually increase salaries because you're paying the employee for skills and knowledge that he or she is capable of using, not what they currently use. The benefit of this is it encourages people to become more effective, right? You're paying people more to become more. And that helps employees because they want to stay at the company and then they feel loyalty to the company. And in the future, they are potentially more willing to stay with the company and work. And now they have these new skills and they're grateful all that stuff. 
So there are four usual categories of these competencies you could pay. One, as I said, is knowledge, like getting a PhD or a master's. One is technical, like learning how more machines work. One is behavioral in terms of learning anger management, learning communication skills, learning how to run a sexual discrimination workshop, just learning more skills. In HR, we would get paid more potentially as we get more certifications, like a coaching certification, or even interpersonal skills, your ability to negotiate, to mediate, to, um, what's the word? There's three kinds of mediation. There is, oh, I forget the word. Eh, it'll come to me. Uh, one other thing to talk about, well, two other things to talk about. One is called broadbanding. Broadbanding, so we've already seen this idea where you had this rate range, right? This, uh, sorry, this wage curve where you had an X and a Y axis uh, on the x-axis was the number of points, right? 100 points, 200 points, 300 points, 400 points, 500 points, you know? And then you also had the, the pay grades. So here's pay grade one, pay grade two, pay grade three, pay grade four. And the more points that a job gets, you look at the arrow and you see how much money they get. Over here is the Money, a beautiful symbol for money, money versus points. And as we saw, this is not a single line, really. It's more like boxes. Broadbanding is when these boxes, ooh, let me color it in. I never colored things in. So, so nice, so satisfying. Okay, so, oh, but it's not straight. Let's make it pretty. Okay, that's pretty. So, Broadbanding is when this box is really broad, where your base pay system puts many different jobs and salary ranges into just a few categories. So here, instead of one, two, three, four, we might only have two. And the reason that we do this, the reason that we would put a lot of jobs together is if things are narrow, if you have a lot of, I mean, we saw the federal government one where they had 15 different grades. If things are narrow, then it limits your flexibility. So let's say that you have someone, let me give a, a real example. Let's say that in our company, we have someone who works right now in marketing and they are grade three in their salary. Now they're really, really interested in doing advertising. We think they'd be good. They really want to try that. They want to move over to the advertising department. But there's a problem. Advertising department, that job they want, gets paid at grade two. So this employee does not want to move down in a grade. And so they decide not to move. They're not satisfied. They end up quitting. Now, that really doesn't work well for us. We lost an employee. And what's more, this employee could have been really, really beneficial for us if we moved her over to advertising where she wanted to be, and then she continued in that and improved and was loyal. We really could have lost a lot of money on this. So what if instead of grade two and grade three, there was just one of those, and she wasn't moving down a grade. She might be moving down in salary a little, but not the grade. Now that's important, as I've said before, the grade is the title, just like your title is manager or your title is assistant manager or your title is senior manager. Grades are like that. Your grade is four or five or six or one. Those things really matter when you're looking for jobs. So the primary objective is to pay people for what they contribute instead of on a narrow salary grade. The emphasis, is on skills and competencies. So this encourages movement without stigma, without classifications. If you wanna move in our company to a different department, to a different job, we just want you to learn skills and competencies. We don't want you thinking about, you went down, you know, we don't want you thinking about things like titles. Titles are much less important these days than they used to be. And so in broadbanding, the way to get 
a promotion or a raise is really based on improved performance. And the advantage is, is you can eliminate a lot of these titles and levels. And then you can have one manager look at each range or be in charge of each range, and that saves money for us. Disadvantage is it is harder to get to the next promotion. So broadbanding might look something like this, where before we had, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six different grades. Now we have one, two, that's it. So all of these people in this, you know, grade, what before was grade four, five, six, they can all maybe be willing to move around in this band and not be so concerned with what grade they have. That's pretty important. Um, last thing to talk about here is called gain sharing. And gain sharing can be very effective, and this gets us into our next. This gets us into our next topic, which is incentives. But after we do this, we'll take a break because we're already a little past an hour. But gain sharing is a kind of compensation that it offers a bonus. And but the bonus is not for you did a great job or customer satisfaction or you learned to drive this this tractor. It's not about you. It's about us, the organization. If productivity improves, we all share the gain, not profit, but productivity. So we have a goal in dollars. And it's based on what the employees cost versus the value of what is sold or produced. And if the employees can contain their costs, we all share the improvement. Uh, studies have shown employees need to have at least a $100 bonus for it to mean anything. Giving people a $20 bonus doesn't matter. It has to be at least $100. But we look at what our employees cost. Let's say every month we pay $10,000 in our salaries and benefits and all these things to employees. And the value of what we make every month is usually $15,000. So we make money. But if the employees can keep their costs low, lower than 10, whatever that difference is, we share with all the employees. Because that's a gain in productivity. Remember, productivity, well, I don't know if we've actually studied this. This is more management idea. Productivity is not what it sounds like in English. Productivity doesn't mean how much you get done. Productivity is typically measured as the amount of money you make versus the amount of money it costs you to make that. That's your productivity. So there are two ways to increase productivity. Either you make more money or your costs go down. If you make 15,000 and you spend 10, that's where you're at. Now, if you spend five, your productivity has gone up. So productivity is quite similar to net profit. Uh, so gain sharing is if the employees can bring their costs down. For example, they don't take clients to so many dinners. They don't do so much overtime. They find different ways to streamline the business. Whatever they do, then the difference between what we used to make and what we're now making, we'll share with all the employees. And that can be very effective as well. Um, oh, one last thing, which is talking about expats. And that's actually pretty important for us. Um, and there's two ways to look at compensating expats. In addition to everything else we've talked about with how to create a pay range and relative worth and compensable factors and all that. There's also these two ways, the balance sheet versus the host country. So the balance sheet says that the expat, their payment should be consistent with what it would have been in their home country. So let's say that in New York City, I made $20 an hour, and then I moved to Shanghai, I should still make $20 an hour. Now, what if in New York, though, or London, somebody made $100,000 a year, and in Shanghai, they don't need that much money? to have the same standard of living. Well, in the balance sheet method, they would still get the same money, $100,000 a year. And so of course, as expats, that's what you want. The host country method, which is obviously more common, certainly in China, is to pay an expat based on the host country. 
So if in, in London, $100,000 a year got you a certain standard of living with apartments and restaurants and a car and whatever, how much would that standard of living cost in China? What are people earning for that job in China? Now, maybe people are only, only earning $40,000 a year. Well, you're going to earn what people earn. Now, there are some benefits to this and some disadvantages, which I think we can just talk about in class mostly because um, we've already kind of gone over time. So, okay, we'll stop with that. And in our next subject, we will talk about